Once upon a time, two friends joined forces to bring you the best in horror entertainment. Brian from the North, Tim from the South, each bringing their own unique perspective to the horror community. Movie reviews, Blu-ray releases, beer pairings, games, and more. Welcome to your new home for horror. This is Civil War. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode 136 of the Civil Gore podcast. I'm your host, Tim. And this is Brian. And Civil Gore, uh, we just, I think I should say this, we have been practicing social distancing for, th- what, now four years? Yes. Three years? <laughs> I think we're really on, the, four seasons, but three years. I mean, I think we've got this down pat. We're right? on the and cutting so edge. We are. We we were doing it before. It was it was it was cool, yeah. but uh, but no, I, I, it's just a little levity, obviously. There with what what's going on out there is is. I mean, if we didn't start the show with this, because of course when we're recording this, this is now Monday, which is a lot of day, which is basically the day where a lot of things have have kind of gone into effect. You know, I mean, movie theaters closed down. Uh, most people are working from home. Uh, it, it's it's. It's almost surreal because it's like we almost are living, it feels like, at some level in one of the horror movies that we might have covered at some point. You know, of course, it's, you know, it's it's something that will we'll get past. We, we you know, we, we know that uh, we're going to get through it. It's just, it's so, t- you know, it's hard sometimes. You have to fight back to, th- of like, some of this, the, the, the fear, really, that you have. Like, there are moments where I'm just like... I just get this anxiety because I'm like, not just worrying if I catch, uh, you know, the, you know, coronavirus, but, you know, if someone I know gets it or, you know, and then there's that stigma. If you get it, like, are you afraid you're going to pass it to somebody else? You know, it's, 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 it's kind of really just, it, it, it's really hard to stay calm all the time through this, I think. Yeah. The biggest thing for me is the fear of the unknown in terms of we don't know how long it's going to take. How long are you going to be in quarantine? I mean, is, it, is this going to be, we're going to be laughing about this, not laughing about, but you know what I mean? We're going to be breathing a sigh of relief at the end of the summer, or are we still going to be dealing with it? We, we just don't know. And nobody knows because we've never really been through it in recent times. So we went through it in 1918, I guess with the Spanish flu, but that's a totally different world now. I mean, you can't really make apples to apples comparisons there. So, uh, yeah, it is scary. And then, of course, I'm definitely scared about the economy and trying yeah. to buy and sell a house and all that. How's that going to impact? So, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of craziness going on. But, hey, you can only worry about what you can control. If you can't control it, don't worry about it. Just do what you can. Help other people where you can. Look out for your family and just have to take it one day at a time, I guess. You know, the, the thing is, is like, you know, if you look towards what, you know, obviously where this, where the, it all started in, you know, in Wuhan, China, I mean, you know, they're recovering now. They're on the path to, things are opening back up again. People are, are healing. So it's not like, like, I think it'd be a lot worse if they were still just getting worse and worse over there. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think the fact that there is, you see that it, there is a cycle now. It's long. It's a lot longer than we hope. Like, this is not like, one of these things where, okay, it'll be like, you know, because, yes, I mean, right now the quarantine, everyone has this this 14-day thing in mind, and it will help. But I just hope, like, after 14 days, people just go, woohoo, it's over, and then go flying outside and, and you know, be all reckless and careless again, you know? It's yeah, like, got to be so responsible. Gotta, yeah, I mean, like, you know, just, I mean, we'll get to this when I go through, but I was like, uh, you know, I was a little nervous uh, with Joe Bob. I mean, he had it. You know, it was scheduled. We had the tickets. Um, it was before, you know, they had closed anything down. It was just kind of talking about it. But, uh, you know, even then, it was just this – like, once the show kicked in, I was okay. But I was, like, re- just the whole night was surreal. I was nervous. I, like – I was afraid to kind of, you know, just, just you know – I was trying to keep my distance from people the best I could there, you know. And, and it's just, like – and it's weird for me because I'm not – I'm someone that – likes to interact a lot you know yeah. um and tim will tell you i never shut up i mean but <laughs> so it's like for me to be quiet and not to kind of include myself in in nearby conversations if i hear something that's interesting and it, meet new people of obviously you know these were all joe bob fans and i wanted to go up and say hey you know you you know you like you know but i was like i was hesitant because i didn't know and it and you know it was, i didn't like that i had to have that that guard up yeah, so to speak. but yeah. it's it's scary. You know, it's true. But um, actually, th- since you uh, I do want to mention something since you um, 
did bring up the uh you know the the you know the helping people and everything i just want to give a shout out i i shared it on twitter um and instagram well actually i didn't share it on instagram i just liked it on instagram but um uh katie michaels who you know you might know she's done uh, dungeon run uh she plays uh lily dumble struck i'm good i hope i got that name right and you know she's been frequented on uh game the game uh she was really funny in the uh <laughs> the uh she was she was pip and uh when they did horrified and she plays um whatchamacallit she plays uh she was on uh, oh Katie Greyhands in the the Water Deep episode. <laughs> um, she actually posted out something. I'm gonna read it verbatim. Just what she did. She wrote, "Hi friends, if you know people in LA, 60 plus, or with trouble standing, I am more than happy to make grocery prescription runs. The lines are bonkers, and not to brag, but I'm pretty great at standing for long periods of time. Please don't hesitate hesitate to reach out." Sending you love and just, you know, just seeing something like that, like out there that someone of, you know, who, you know, she's really well known in the gaming community, you know, especially the, the D&D fans from Dungeon Run. They, you know, so, you know, the, so I felt like instantly I had to share that to get that to as many people as we can, because, you know, she just based on from what it looks like, the fact that she, you know, that she was willing to, to take her time where everyone is kind of panicked, but she put that aside and wants to go help someone is i think is awesome so i i think think that was definitely you know you want to see more of that you know especially for people that are known you know it's like you know it's like sure i could i would do it if i could but you know it's like i don't know how many people i'd reach if i sent that out there but, yeah, exactly but uh yeah you know someone that's that's well known out there is that's great so yeah and katie's just seems like she's awesome just if you follow her social media she's really cool and like it's not surprising that she just would would, would send something out there like that so yeah yeah just just Find the opportunities to help other people during this, and and they're out there, and and especially for our older people that um, maybe can't get out or are not as mobile, or you know, maybe they're afraid to ask for help. You know, just reach out and, and find out if there's anything they need, that kind of thing. If you have the means more than somebody else, it's a great thing to uh, to just at least ask the question: Is there anything that I can do? Sometimes that's enough to just make someone who's nervous calmer, even if they have all their stuff, just to know that someone was out there, someone else was thinking about them, you know, especially the people that might live alone, you know, who feel like now they're isolated. Like, I mean, I, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm at home and uh, Julie's uh, working from home this week. So we, we, you know, we have each other to kind of like bang the, the, the nerves off of. And, you know, nowadays, I mean, I was talking to my friend Mark about this and, and Cone too. I'm like, what about, imagine this was years ago when we didn't have cell phones and no social media. I mean, imagine the, what that must've been like. It would be like then where you can't communicate so freely, like, you know, in our group, our, our Slack group mm-hmm. that we talk to people on and, and just, things that we you know we should like we're always i'd like i feel like no one's too far you know but i so it's but there are some people that don't have that you know kind of a kind of connection out there to do that so it's like sometimes just saying hey is there anything you need even if they have everything they could possibly need just knowing that someone else has said that it helps and and actually speaking of that with the uh with the you know the older people that might need help um stop and shop today i i think it's wherever they're located, the shop shop uh, supermarket, they're actually, whether in their limited hours, they are putting an hour and a half uh, for 60 and over. Oh, that's cool. To be cool. exclusive shoppers in the morning. And, you know, they're usually up early. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's that old joke, you know, they're up at like four in the morning. My grandmother like went to bed at 10 and got up at four. But yeah, so I think it's like 6 a.m. to 7.30. They will, they will have exclusive time in the stores to go get what they need. And they're not being bombarded by, you know, crazy shoppers running in and and although when i went i stopped by um our local grocery store on friday just to get a couple of like it wasn't like super essentials it was just something like you know like julie was like you know i should have bought a little bit more pasta brewery out so i said you know what i'm gonna go by there anyway and i went in and you know for most part people seemed to be okay in that store like there was a you know this weird sense going on but it was almost like a camaraderie at the same time like people i think were you know, like, oh, excuse me, let me get by, you know, it's yeah. being really friendly. And there's that, there's that, you know, that little camaraderie when there's a crisis, because it's like, no one is better off right now. We're all in this together. We all have to deal with the same thing. And there's no need to have any animosity and fight over things. Just make sure everyone has something at this point. <laughs> yeah, and I would say add to that, go out of your way to be just a little bit nicer uh, when you're out, just out and about, because 
everybody's under a tremendous amount of stress and you don't know what their home situation is. You don't know what their job situation is. You don't know what their food situation is. So conscientiously understand that everybody's under a tremendous amount of stress and we, we've all got to be just a little more patient, but uh, we'll get through it. We'll, of course yes, we'll get through it. We so, uh, you know, we'll uh, just ride it out. Hey, we, we've been training this our whole lives. We've watched enough horror movies, guys. So we've we watched have, enough zombie hey. movies. So you know how to get through this. Yes, we will. We will all get through this. There's, <laughs> as far as I know, no one's eating anybody yet. So that's right. That's, that's, it that's could be worse. It could be worse. All right. All it right. Really so uh, I guess with that, we will get to our first chop. <laughs> all right, Brian. So I'm going to start off with a little non-horror tidbit, but I think it would be of interest to our listeners because we've mentioned the show on Civil Gore before. That is Amazing Stories. That was an anthology yes. we, a lot of us watched, uh, produced by Steven Spielberg back in the day. And Such a great show. Fantastic show. And it was, I, I was trying to describe it to somebody who's never seen Amazing Stories before. And the, the description I came up with was, it's like Twilight Zone if you take out the sci-fi and the horror. You can still maybe have some of the twist, but it's not in a scary or futuristic sci-fi uh, means. Uh, more like a fantasy comic booky way. I yeah, would think. yeah. It's and it's it's more, I guess, maybe more a little family oriented. I would say. Um, yeah. The uh, this one is debuting on Apple TV. I think it's an exclusive to Apple TV. I ended up getting a year's subscription to Apple TV when I bought my phone, so that's the only reason I've got it. There's not enough content on Apple TV right now for me to have wanted to pay for it, honestly. Uh, but I thought I would give my review. They they have released the first two episodes of Amazing, of Amazing Stories. It is again produced by uh, Steven Spielberg. And I will tell you, Brian, I, after watching the first two episodes, I kind of got the same feel that I did with the CBS's Twilight Zone reboot. It was good. Uh, I was entertained, but it didn't blow me away. And I just can't mm. put my finger on why these reboots of these anthologies are just not capturing me. And I, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't know what is, except for the creep show. A creep yeah, show creep I thought show was did. I was going to say creep show. I thought, but, got um, it, but the twilight zone one left me a little hollow and this one kind of the same way, at least based on these first two episodes. Uh, the first episode I actually enjoyed a little more than the second. The, the first one was about uh, a guy that, stumbles into kind of a time portal and goes back to 1913, maybe 19, somewhere in there, early 1900s. And he meets a woman and there's kind of a time travel love story going on it on there. I I'm just a big sucker for time travel stories. I love time travel stuff. In fact, I just bought a big anthology on Kindle of time story, time travel stories. And uh, so I I really, I just like that. I, I love the idea of it. So I kind of enjoyed that one. The second one was called The Heat, and this was about uh, two African-American girls who are best friends, and one of them gets hit by a car and dies. And it's Great. like their bond is so strong that you f- you find out what happens with this girl in her afterlife and, and her best friend. And it tackled a lot of uh, racial issues. Uh, that's the reason I mentioned their race. There's a lot of uh, racial and, so- and social issues brought up in it, which I thought was interesting. I thought it was great that they had a an episode with a diverse cast. But again, it was one of those. It was like, eh, it wasn't. I mean, it, it didn't just it didn't blow me away. It was good. It was entertaining. I did not like it, but it just didn't blow me away. And I, I'm I, I don't know if that's going to be representative of the entire series or just these two episodes. But so far, I mean, it's good, but it's not something I would have signed up for Apple TV for, I guess. Mm, okay. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how the season plays out. But um, I think there's only going to be six episodes of this, at least the first season. So Yeah, I may just do a trial, like one of those trials once it's all done. Yeah, that might be the best, watch best way to do this. Um, I, I kind of poked around Apple TV looking for anything kind of horror related, and I just really, I really couldn't find much of that I was really interested in. There is a... Uh, there's a series with um, uh, Jason Momoa that looks decent that I, I might want to check out at some point. And there is a kind of a role-playing fantasy type show about a development company for a role-playing game that, that might be kind of uh, interesting. So th- there's a couple things on there that have piqued my interest that I'm probably I'm, will have plenty of time to check out during quarantine <laughs> since I'm working from home yeah. for the foreseeable future. But uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, yeah, amazing stories. Yeah, if you already have Apple TV, go ahead, check them out. If you don't, not worth signing up for right yet. I would give it a kind of a cautious recommendation, but don't spend money on it yet. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you know, it's funny though. Uh, real quick before I get to uh, to my uh, next segment, um, one of the 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 things that's like getting getting crazy is with so many different streaming services now that are coming out. There's just the content is so stretched out over them that it's like, you know, at some point you're gonna you, you can't get all of them really because at this point you you know you cut the cord and just say I'm gonna get all streaming things before you know it you're spending two hundred dollars a month on just all the different streaming services yeah so it's like you almost have to just kind of that's what I like that Disney Plus did with their Hulu package you know you got Hulu ESPN for one like little package and I think um. You know, I think I'm, I'm wondering if that'll be the future at some point or there'll be other bundles when they'll get together. I feel because... like there has to be some consolidation at some point because I don't believe the market is going to bear people spending money on 10 different streaming services. Yeah. Not when you have one, like one, just just one signature show like Netflix will always be because they they're just their content is just it's like comes from this like like unlimited pool of of things right and there's always and prime stuff. already always new prime things. bundling in with their prime service you're getting other benefits on top of their streaming right. service so that's going to be okay. right yeah that's fine because you get your shipping you get you get all this stuff i mean so that that's like uh you know that's those two right there won't be beat i think hulu will have its have its big niche too because of tv so those big three i think you can feel good about owning those three and getting your money's worth for all of them. And, of course, Disney Plus you throw in now is completely different because it's all its own content, basically. And, but it, it came into the – it came in late but with a library that's unmatched that you – know, Well, yeah, like, you have arguably two of the biggest IPs on the planet in Marvel and, and, yeah. and Star Wars, not to mention Disney itself. Yeah, so it's like – you know, so right there, if you – let's just say you get those four services, you're looking at – if you break it down, so what does Prime come to about ten bucks a m- no, just about eight bucks a month if you break it up for twelve yeah. months and you pay the yearly. Yeah, let's just say let's let's, let's say, say nine for argument's yeah, sake, nine. right? Or ten? Nine, nine or ten. Okay. Yeah. They went up recently. Yeah, you know, we'll do it ten. So you got ten for that. If you buy the package of Disney Plus, that's thirteen, it's twenty three, and Netflix is thirteen. So that's thirty what I say, thir- thirteen plus 13 no uh, 23 plus 13 so it's 36 dollars, and you get those four streaming services that's pretty much gets you a so much content that you know if you're a cord cutter you add that in with whatever internet service you do you're you're at about a probably like a hundred bucks let's say yeah that's pretty much where people that cord cut want to stay at yeah yeah so I don't think that, you know, you get with – I mean, yeah, you may have some little niche ones like, you know, what's that one? Quibi or Quiddy coming out? What is that one? Yeah. That, uh, well, then you got the, like that NBC Peacock thing coming out and you got yeah, CBS. I, I just – I don't know. I feel like at some point – I guess it depends. I mean, it depends on what the market will bear, obviously. CBS oh. may find that they get enough subscribers just off their content that they can support it. Then I guess – Okay, good for them. I mean, I just feel like at some point people are going to say enough's enough. And shame on us for getting our, our possibly our most needed one, which was Shutter. I think it just it's so embedded in my head. I don't even that one's it. automatic. You don't even you don't even mention. Yeah, it. it's it's like it does it. Like I realize that I'm saying it. I'm like I know I'm forgetting one, and I'm like oh duh, Shutter <laughs> because Shutter we we just. I mean, pretty much that's one that I don't even count in there because I don't care if it was $50 a month. That would be one we would need to own because they're content. And that actually probably leads us right into our next uh, next topic here. Yeah. Was uh, that Julie and I uh, got to attend or the Joe Bob How Redneck Save Hollywood. So it was um, the one thing that changed. I think the biggest thing that, like I said earlier, a little bit, you know, with the, the uneasiness of of. It being last Wednesday and, and, you know, it was right before all this, you know, really the crackdowns of stuff started to happen. Um, so we got there um, probably about like maybe like 10 to 7. The show was starting at 730 and there was going to be a meet and greet before and after uh, with it ending that late. And it was a work night. Um, Julie and I were both tired. We really didn't think we were going to stay for the meet and greet afterwards. But we got there and there was a, a line of like maybe, you know, like 40 people like online crammed really close together. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I look at it. I'm like, you know what? And Julie and I were kind of concerned. I was like, I kind of want to get a seat that's kind of like a little bit in a good seat away. So we're not like packed in because this is not a big theater. It's one of those art center it's yeah. theaters, you know, that's it's really not 
a lot of spacious seats like you would in a regular theater. Uh, so I, I, Julie, like we took the option right as we got there. We looked at the line. I'm like, I really don't want to stay in this line. You know, I saw Joe Bob and Darcy hanging out and they were signing, taking pictures, being awesome as they are. Um, but I'm like, I don't really want to wait in line. And right then the lady said, OK, we're opening the theater now. So I looked at Julie and I'm like, I think that's our move because uh, we probably wait on this line for another 40 minutes and then come in and get a horrible seat. Yeah. So we walked in. We got a really good seat. It was an edge seat kind of off to the side, but perfect view of where Joe Bob's podium was. So I knew that was a good shot. Um, And what was good about it is so we were at one of those sections where it was right by the door. So everyone walked through past, but we had the barrier there. So there was no seats in front of us. Julie had the edge. There was no. There was an aisle next to her on, on the right side, and the seats were a little bit more spaced out there. So we had a little bit more of that, like kind of distance that we were kind of looking for, which was good. I mean, someone was sitting next to me on the right, but I don't think the guy breathed, let alone <laughs> uh, breathed on me. So <laughs> he was so quiet, it was so funny. He was like, D- "Is that seat taken?" I'm like, "No, no, no, go right ahead." And then didn't hear a word, didn't even breathe the rest of the, <laughs> the, the, the evening, but it was funny. But, um, but yeah, getting back to Joe Bob, you know, in typical Joe Bob fashion, he's great. I'm not going to go into obviously every detail and every joke he says. Some of them you might have heard on his show, yeah. but it was like if everything you love about Joe Bob is represented in this like two plus hour thing. And let me tell you, for the price he charges for a ticket, 25 bucks, you probably get about a hundred dollars worth. I mean, of that's Joe a Bob. good long show. Most comedians, you go see like a professional yeah. comedian, you're looking at an hour tops. Yeah, and he gives you great Joe Bob stuff. He gives you ton of film history, and you know, you know, people, you know, don't realize what a just an incredible wealth of knowledge he is on the film industry. He is a film genius. I mean, he comes off, you know, as funny and as his Joe Bob character, but he really knows a ton of stuff and i i just get mesmerized when he goes on his on his it is like history things and he basically so basically this whole thing is how you know literally based off the theme as he shows how the redneck film you know type films based on you know how basically changed hollywood and how it made all this money for hollywood but got like no credit kind of thing and it's it's really good but he starts off in typical joe bob fashion he goes oh yeah so you know he mentions the whole coronavirus thing going on he's like yeah i know we got this going on uh so i'm so glad you all came here to volunteer to catch it (laughs) so you know typical like you know right off the bat let let everyone kind of everyone's at ease and starts laughing and then and then he does the one of the funniest things which where he comes on and he'll go he goes so i guess i gotta give a trigger warning here you know, and he tells his history on how he used to have to give uh, the trigger warnings to the elderly. And now he goes, has to feel like he has to do it to the millennials. <laughs> but uh, but he goes, he goes, so here's your trigger warning. And then he shows someone like shooting like a machine gun. He goes, you're going to get triggered. And that's what he does. That's his trigger warning. And then he just goes through the history, shows clips, shows some stills, gives history. And just, you know, throughout his whole thing is just complete everything joe bob you love on the on his shutter show and and other shows and monster vision in the past you get like live in person and like tim said it's like a two plus hour show and you could tell he gives so much into every show so it's it's and he just you could tell he's having a great time like he loves just the interaction to the audience and he loves hearing the reactions like he'll shout out because anyone see this movie, you know, and it's like some rare obscure thing. And when someone said yes, he's like, what? he goes, you saw that. <laughs> and it's just you could just tell yeah. he's like, having a ball and we had a ball and it was so it's so fun. And Ju- Julie actually gets a real kick out of him when I'm watching uh, Last Drive In. So she was actually really having a good time with the, some, you know, she was cracking it, like audibly laughing out loud. It was great. So, uh, That's cause awesome. I, you know, I didn't. Yeah. So she really likes it, too. And I just loved, loved the thing. So I, if this comes to your town once this all blows over, obviously, I mean, I, he probably had to halt some of this tour because this kind of guy, like Tim said, this kind of just got in under the wire. I think this uh, this event um, do yourself a favor. This is worth every penny and you feel like you're not paying enough is how good this show is that's awesome yeah i would love for him to come near here at some point because i'd love to see that show yeah it, it is it is great all right guys uh the last year on the first chop is um uh, just want to give a kind of a message about the number of cons that have been canceled of course or postponed in a lot of cases they're yeah. just postponed. yeah most of them postponed i think yeah. yeah but one of the big things that people maybe 
don't think about is how many vendors rely on these conventions to uh, make their living. So we want to just urge everybody to support your favorite vendors online or go look at some of the vendors that were going to be at these cons and go check out their websites and maybe order some stuff just to uh, help them out during this time when they, when all their, their basic source of income is gone, it's been taken away. So, or at least postponed and help kind of help them out uh, and you know buy a few things like, like, for example, ghost girl greetings who, we yes. uh, had on the show and unfortunately lost their audio, which we are still beating we, ourselves up over. <laughs> yes, we will have them back. We, we will. We pr- I promise. They I was so hoping wonderful. to actually talk to them. Yeah, I was going to talk to them at New Jersey HorrorCon, which now that it got delayed, I may, maybe uh, I know we had talked about Nico, but I may try and make an effort to go to the newer new date if possible. It's at the end of June. Um, cause basically the th- there were three big, uh, cons that happened right near each other in New Jersey, uh, around this time and it's monster mania, the New Jersey horror con and chiller. And all three of them got postponed. Um, good news is I know at least with the uh, New Jersey horror con, most of the big names are, are going to be able there. They haven't announced everybody yet, but like, I know like Felissa Rose for sure is going to be there. Um, she already kind of tweeted out something. Um, so, um, you know, and they're, they've been really good about it and, and, you know, they've been trying so hard to hold out as long as they could. I saw some criticism like, well, why did you tell us? You know, these guys are trying to run a con is not easy. They're trying to make the arrangements and give you all the information at once so you don't. Because they said, OK, we're going to postpone it. What is everyone going to do? Start saying, oh, well, wait, can I get my money back? Are they going to come again? Are they going to do it? So they were trying to gather as much information as possible and hold out as long as they could. They were working with the hotels. They're working with the the vendors are working with the the guests there's a lot of pieces in play that they were trying to get all the information so kind of like you know uh, you know and i saw some criticism that i'm like these guys are doing their best they're trying to i mean that's say salvage that's a hard thing to do even in the best of times if everything's going well that's a tremendous effort and you imagine something like this coming up that was unexpected and then they're trying to scramble and, you know, and then everybody's wanting answers at the same time. It's it's a lot of stress. So, yeah, again, one of those things we go back to, just have more patience during this time. Everybody's under a tremendous amount of stress. But, um, yeah, just, just go check out your vendors. There's some really, really good artists and stuff out there that are just doing some fantastic stuff. So, uh, yeah, give them, a, give them a, a, some patronage. Yeah, because they, they literally, they you know, this is like they budget this in. This is like... You know, and especially some of the people, you know, there are people that would be at all three of those cons. And like, you know, that's a lot of promotion they lose. That's a lot of sales they lose. And they make this stuff well in advance to make sure they have a supply on hand. And now it's just sitting there. So they've laid out the money with no recourse to get it back, you know, anytime soon. I mean, sure, they'll recoup. They'll be okay in the end. But like, you know, kind of help them out in the meantime, like especially, yeah, like Ghost Girls, they, you know, I made sure I retweeted them because, you know, they have, they're so popular, but they, they rely a lot on their, their, their con appearances to really get like, that's how we discovered them. And, you know, like that guy Frank's Kids makes those cool things mm-hmm. and our buddy Neil Cohen, his books, you know, that he that he sells and he sells a lot at the convention. So, yeah, I mean, just any any. So think back to all those shows you've been at the past and some of your favorite vendors guarantee you they have an online store of some sort. Yeah. Or at least share their name out there so it stays fresh when the con season gets picked up again because it will come back and everyone will go again. And it'll be better than ever. And you'll see all your friends. And but. In the meanwhile, let's just try and help them out the best we could. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, guys, if you were expecting a lighter toned episode from what we've given you already <laughs> in light of current events, yeah. uh, unfortunately, this is not the movie that's going to give it to you. Yeah. So this Sorry. movie was a last second pick, and it's one that I had wanted to see. Brian had wanted to see as well. Yeah. We decided to pick it. We definitely wanted to see this. It was on Netflix. It came out on Netflix fairly recently, I believe. It's a 2019 right. film, but it just uh, it's been available for streaming fairly recently. So we thought it would be uh, current, and we had Batted around some ideas I had thought of In the Mouth of Madness, which is a fantastic Lovecraftian film, but we had just done Color Out of Space, and I just didn't want to do another Lovecraft film so soon after that one. And then Brian had suggested uh, maybe doing, um, uh, what was the one Kim and Kat did that we were thinking of doing? Oh, yeah, they 
the quiet place they did because we still wanted to do that around this time because but now that the sequel got delayed i guess it's it's okay that we push that back anyway yeah so. i was kind of thinking that in my mindset i was thinking well i don't want to do it if kim and ken are doing it this week but also mainly because i wanted to do it closer to the sequel and i knew that the sequel right. had been postponed so that was a primary reason we had batted around some other ideas we thought of course doing like a disease movie quarantine or contagion but then again we were like yeah it's a little too on the nose right now and not yeah. knowing how that i mean i don't even want to watch it. our buddy aunt sue she was watching all these movies she's like doing a marathon oh, on man. it and i'm like yeah it's a little too close for me but yeah, uh... <laughs> not knowing how bad this thing's gonna get i just felt like that was a little too uh yeah, like I said, a little too touchy a subject right now, so we don't want to touch that one. So we uh, we just had to go for you know kind of a random crazy pick, and boy, would we get a crazy one! Uh, the girl yeah. on the third floor is directed by Travis Stevens. It stars uh, CM Punk, Phil Brooks uh, as Don Cook, Trieste, Trieste Kelly Dunn as Liz Cook, Sarah Brooks as Sarah Yates, Alyssa Dowling as Sadie, Karen Wodich as Ellie Mueller. Travis Delgado as Milo Stone and Marshall Bean as Gary McCabe. So the synopsis is Don Cook tries to renovate a rundown mansion with a sordid history for his growing family, only to learn that the house has other plans. So this movie is about, so CM Punk is a, uh, is a guy who's bought this house, a uh, beautiful house, old house, and he's renovating it and trying to fix this thing up. And the first half hour of the movie is essentially uh, his, I guess, adventures fixing this house yeah. up. <laughs> There's not a whole yeah. lot going on in the first half hour. Uh, you get a little bit of a kind of a creepy vibe from it. Uh, you, I mean, obviously, this is a horror movie. You know something's going to happen at some point. And there's right. some kind of gross stuff like where he'll stick his hand through a rotted piece of the wall and some gunk comes out and... Um, some little strange little happenings here and there, but we don't really know what's going on. Uh, he does meet a neighbor, uh, Sarah uh, Brooks, who is very flirty. Uh, remember, he is married. He's getting this ready for his wife and right. child. Pregnant wife. Pregnant yeah. wife and child. Uh, she comes over, is very flirty, and ends up kind of seducing him into a tryst. I will say, and uh, he, which he, which he regrets, but uh, she, she kind of has a sinister vibe about her. And after that, things start going really crazy, really fast. Um, there's just some of the random things. He sees marbles coming out of the walls at times. He's having very vivid, crazy nightmares. Um, he's seeing things maybe moving in the house, uh, strange things coming out of the walls and outlets and it gets really, really bizarre, really, really quick. Um, Brian, what did you think of this movie? I will, I'll have to say my thoughts about this movie before we go into any more details about the plot yeah. is I felt like from a horror fan perspective, there were some fantastic gore scenes in here. There was some, there were some really good horror elements in this movie that I really enjoyed. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those a little bit later when we talk about uh, the nymph character who shows up yeah. in the movie which i thought was a brilliant design i loved it but the acting was a little stilted for me it wasn't that it was it wasn't that it was bad bad like you would see like in a very low budget like just terrible horror film it wasn't that it was that level of bad um like you said i think brian you said in the rundown that um cm punk can act fine in small doses <laughs> Short doses. Yeah. Well, yeah, like he was in Rabbit yeah. and he had a small, like, kind of like little scene, you know, maybe scene and a half. And he was fine in there. I mean, it was not the greatest. Like, it's not like he's like going to be, be up for best supporting actor, right. but he was fine in that. But I don't think he's quite ready for to lead a movie like this. And this was a lot of him kind of acting. You know, he interacted with people somewhat, but there was a lot of him like kind of just doing things and it yeah, <laughs> didn't like doing handy by himself and, yeah yeah and, and there was, it was to me there was also something off about the dialogue and i don't know i couldn't quite put my finger on it but the performance when performances when there was dialogue again the acting wasn't like cringeworthy bad it was passable but when two characters were were interacting the dialogue almost seemed like a half second delayed or something it was really weird i just couldn't get couldn't wrap my mind around 
it just sounded stilted to me for some reason. I don't know if it was the dialogue as it was written was just not good or if it was the way it was delivered. I just, I really never could put my finger on why I felt the, there was just no flow between the characters. It was weird. Did you notice that at all, Brian? Well, yeah. And there was, there was something that, that kind of irked me and it was obviously intentional. But there was something about the way the in, in terms of the cinematography and the way a lot of this was shot, where the characters would be talking to another character, but they'd be looking right at the viewer. It was like dead on, with no like no juxtaposition, no little slant to it, where it's like they'd be looking a little bit off camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it almost looked like they were breaking the fourth wall when they weren't. You were like, and I guess that was it was intention. It was obviously intentional because they repeated it several times throughout the movie but it was actually it, it kind of took me out of the movie especially when a lot there were these close-ups of cm punk's character and he's like looking right at you and he would do this smirk where i said the only way what it reminded me of it was like it looked like he was drawn by one of the archie comic <laughs> illustrators where it had this like the mouth was like on a like a diagonal like smirk upwards you know like like Archie's face would be, it was like, but he almost looked like a like Reggie a little bit. So it was, I don't know, it like it kind of distracted me a little. But and you know, and it was like, and I think what in the, what he, and the funny thing is, there were some great performances. Like I thought, you know, the uh, Sarah Brooks would did a great job as like the seductress kind of role where yeah. you know she was like she's kind of creepy but like you know appealing, and you didn't quite know what to expect of her. And I thought. uh Treese Kelly Dunn, who played his wife, was leaps and bounds above everybody. Yeah, she was, definitely and it actually the best. made her look misplaced. Like they, like it was almost if they. And I feel bad because I don't mean to bash the other performances because, you know, because I thought, like I said, I thought I thought uh, Sarah Yates was really, really good in it, but, uh, but it was almost like they, you know, in softball game when they call in a ringer, yeah, yeah. you know, like someone who just comes <laughs> yeah. in and clouts like six <laughs> home runs in a game, but they don't always play. That's what I felt like when they brought her in because, like, when she finally came in, you know, she was mostly shown in the beginning on a phone, a cell phone. Yeah. But then when she actually came into the story in person at the and she had to really like show her acting chops, I was like, wow, she's really good. And it somewhat made the movie uneven because yeah. it only like it like took it to a new level that the beginning didn't have. And I think just overall, probably the pacing was a little off. Well, like I said, like that, fir- yeah, that, that first 30 minutes was I actually texted Brian and I said, is this this movie looks like this old house boring edition because it was basically yes. him <laughs> renovating this house. And I was like, when is something going to happen? And, you know, we've mentioned it many times on the show. I don't mind slow burn movies. I, there's a ton of slow right. burn horror movies that I absolutely love. The Witch, The Lighthouse, uh, Suspiria, any of these these that we yeah. we think are slow burn, I absolutely love. So it's not that. It's just something about the pacing's off. Yeah, and there was some vibes to other horror films. I mean, I felt like, especially towards at the end when there was like, you couldn't tell if there was a, fla- it was like almost like a flashback or were there ghosts or where there were other things where I kind of got a, a House on Haunted Hill vibe, like the newer version more so. Um, I'll tell you the vibe I got, like, Brian, thir- was uh, American Horror Story vibe. See, I don't watch that show, but I, I could probably just based on a little I know about it, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, there was a bit, uh, there was a beginning reminding me of the Changeling when the ball, co- that first marble comes down yeah. the stairs. I'm like, okay, there's the Changeling reference. Um, there was a little bit of Thirteen Ghosts in there for me. There was a, there was just a lot of other uh, kind of references to other horror movies, and I, you know what, there was I, I, I don't know, like I don't, and this is odd for me, like. I know there was a score to it, but I think in the beginning of the scenes, there was an absence of score in scenes where you would expect a score. And I think that threw me off a little too, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like it may have been there, but it may just not have been there strong enough for me to have, have uh, you know, got it. Like, And it was like this, there was this weird isolation vibe. Like when he goes to the bowling alley and there's like, just the bartender, I got like a shining vibe almost. I'm like, is this whole town yeah. like something wrong with it? But then the next night he's there and there's like a hundred people in the bowling alley. So I, I don't understand. And I don't know what kind of meal he had of like literally link sausage, mashed potatoes and, and, and peas. But it was like not like the big banger sausage. It was like little like – like uh, what's the uh, – not Bobby Jones. What's the uh, the sausage? It's, oh, Jimmy uh, Dean. 
Jimmy Dean, yeah. Bobby Jones. But <laughs> Bobby Jones sausage. Where am this I episode getting? of where Civil War I... is brought to you by Bobby Jones Sausage. I know. Where, where am I? Where am I going? <laughs> uh, I couldn't remember the Shining Room last week. Uh, but yeah, so um, but yeah, like so it was like those little link, like Jimmy Dean's link sausages, those tiny little things. Um, and uh, like so it was very weird, just in general, but. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was very like you know, and they they I think they used the dog, the they overused the dog device a little bit in the beginning. Yeah, he has a but dog. Anyway, that's so kind I, of um, yeah, it's it's like he and he doesn't seem to care about the dog. It's just a lot of like weird stuff going. But I I will say this: it was um, as you know, I know it sounds like we are just smashing and bashing this movie, but the thing is, I I actually overall, I didn't hate it. I would That's never say how I, I feel, I don't, and I was and I was like, coming into this very pessimistically because I had actually texted Brian. Maybe this isn't the movie we want to do because yeah, he did, and I like because it was getting was like, just no, destroyed in the Shockwaves Horror uh, thread. In you know, I mean, the Shockwaves Horror group on Facebook. I mean, they were like, "Yeah, this movie's garbage." Blah 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 blah. People were just bashing it right left. I read a whole thread of like ten negative comments about it. So I was going in this, going, "Oh my god, this is going to be a complete train wreck." And I ended up actually not hating it. Like I said, I can't say that I loved it. I can't say that I right. I don't know if I even want to say that I really liked it. But there was some things about it that were just intriguing enough that I found interesting. And I, and for that reason, I can't hate it. Like the um the design for the nymph. You'll, there's a character in here called the nymph. Which without is is that the nymph or is the nymph the other the the brunette that like kind of appears? I, I that's the part I got confused. I thought in the wiki that I read that the nymph was the actual weird looking thing that you see. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, I think I believe that I I do believe that's right though. I believe that she's she's listed. Yeah, yeah, with has the mangled face and everything. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, the nymph is the the, the form. Yeah. So I, okay. See, that, but you know that's a criticism right there. Is it's really difficult to tell who what what some of these other little superfluous characters really what their names were in it. I guess. Yeah, but, but that uh, design <laughs> was super cool. It looked like again yeah. yeah, that gave me a real American Horror Story vibe out of it, but. I thought it was a fantastic character design. It was scary. It was, um, it was. Yeah, it was like a. It was a face like it was like, like almost like if you had, like an accident and they chopped the face in half and they were like holding it together with like string or something. Yeah, That's what this and she thing like would like. giggle really... and like a girl like yeah, <laughs> yeah they make these weird sounds. It was really disturbing. I thought it was fantastic, and. Uh, that was that stuff was great, and there was some, like like I said, there's some great gore scenes. There's a kill scene with uh, Milo that's really gruesome. Oh, that actually Julie verbally like and like like said oh oh oh, and she like turned and like because she was watching with me, and she like literally turned her head. And she's like she goes, "What happened? Did, did the eye cut?" Like she literally could not look back because it was and that was like a really strong yeah. scene, and it was and and it held long. And you know what it is? I think, and I I, I mean. I think this is kind of what this is. I think the world of this movie, it's like basically it's it, it, it is great. Like the the premise overall, like the, the the surrounding things, and it's and and it's parts. But it like it seems like if the parts were put together better, this would be a, a overall a much better film. Like it had so many good parts, but so many bad parts, and it seemed like if it was like just tweaked a little bit in certain spots. This may have been strong. I hate to say it. I feel like, like you said before, CM Punk just was not the right person to lead this movie. I don't think he's strong enough to carry this movie of what it expects of him. I mean, it's only a second movie. I yeah. Think, right. I, yeah. So, so, I mean, and I'm not trying to criticize the guy at all. I, I just think. No, because he'd kill us in yeah, two seconds. Yeah. I don't want to go up against him. mangle us. But. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't think it was a good fit. Like sometimes he reminded me of Bruce Campbell as Ash. Sometimes he kind of had this goofiness to yes. him. Yes. Yeah. You... That's the Archie comic vibe yeah. I got. Yeah. Where he had that smirk. Yeah. He had this like... goofiness that almost would think you make you think this was a horror comedy. And I think he'd actually be yeah. really good in a horror comedy. If this was right, like an Evil right. Dead type thing, I think he'd be fantastic. It was just actually you just named the perfect Ash replacement if Bruce Campbell does not come yeah, back. Yeah, but so he kind of had that vibe <laughs> to him, and the whole time I'm almost expecting this to turn comedic in a way because of him, but it's not at all. In fact, the horror is very intense and very serious, and I just I don't feel like that meshed. I don't think his personality meshed with the horror they were trying to convey. And there's even some 
sequences in here where they try to inject some comedy, like like for instance when he goes down to the bowling alley and it's deserted, and the guy's like, "This thing eats a lot of balls" or something like that. And, and there's like these funny little quips, and and you're they just somehow they don't mesh with the horror that you get later in the movie. It's almost like I don't know. Like I said, it's it's, it's almost like they had a really good horror movie mixed with some elements that just didn't congeal right. Yeah. It, you, you know what analogy I would give it? Like, you know those games, like, like okay, in Horrified, that one thing when you're doing the mummy and you're moving the pieces around to try and yeah. get them all in order? It's like with those numbers, like, one, two, three, four, five, six. But, like, instead they had, like, six was in eight space and nine was in four yeah. but, or something <laughs> like that. Like, it was, like, it was all there, just not put together right. Yeah. The ultimate plot of the movie, I mean, basically all you need to know is this house used to be a brothel and it's supernaturally haunted intensely. And because it was like kind of it had some evil elements yeah. to that brothel. It wasn't just a yes run of the mill. Yeah, it brothel. wasn't because it was a brothel. It's haunted now. It, it, there were some very evil goings on there, and because of that, you've got these really, really strange happenings. And not even I wouldn't even say from a haunting perspective because these are physical manifestations of things right. that are happening that are that go be, way beyond just ghost type stuff. This is stuff that's like physically happening. And, yeah, because it interacts with the yeah, characters. Yeah, yeah, there's like it's, physical it's, yeah. ramifications of this. And it gets, you know, it dials up and it gets really intense. But then I thought the last act when um, Don's wife shows up, I don't know, for some reason it kind of, uh, there's, there's don't get me wrong, there's certain scenes that are really good. There's a particular scene in, in particular involving uh, Sarah and Don and the wife that is, very intense and very good. But something about that last maybe 20 minutes of the movie just fell a little flat to me. I don't know if you felt the same way, Brian, but something about it just didn't, I don't know. Well, it, it seemed like, it, yeah, because it kind of like they brought in the, like the, the, the A-game players and the A-game point, but then like they really didn't have enough time. to. So they kind of, like by pushing so much in at the same time, it didn't, it didn't gel as much as it could, so you didn't get the emotional impact you probably could have if it was a little bit less rushed at the end. Yeah. So I see what you mean by flat because it was like – I feel like you should have been like – had that reaction like, oh, that's why. But you didn't get that. Yeah, I think the like, plot structure – I mean, Brian were actually discussing this before with the episode. I was like, I really – I'm struggling to talk about this movie because I don't know that I fully understood everything that was going on. There was some elements of the narrative that I just was missing. And I don't know if it's because I'm too dense and I just wasn't, wasn't no, but, or if it, there was we, genuinely some problems with the narrative structure that I just didn't, I couldn't really, it, like you said, there was never that, Oh, that's why this, there was nothing that ever put that all together. It was kind of just felt a little ambiguous and vague at the end. Yeah, I mean, I you know what it is? I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know much about this director. I think he's, if this is, I, he could have done like 15 films. I don't know. I didn't look. But he, if he, you know, if this was his first film, you definitely see that he has gotten, got a lot of potential. I mean, because there are some, like we said a bunch of times, there's some great elements in there. Great elements. But it just needs to be. I think if it was put together a little better, I think you might have had something stronger. But, I mean, listen, you know, we both didn't ha hate it. Yeah, so it looks like he – okay, I pulled him up. It looks like he did a lot of producing. Um, but Oh, wait, no directing. So Yeah, no, you know what? Okay, so he did one other movie before this. It was a documentary short. So this was his first feature. So – that said, it's still a pretty good first feature. Yeah, I would yeah. Say, I would, knowing director. that, I would say I would definitely check out his next movie because I feel like there yeah, was enough because... promise here. I feel like there's something there because the horror was re the the horror elements that were there yeah. were really really good. Yeah, so he understands the horror element, which not everyone can right. can handle. So that's good that he got that. And I think, and again, I know we were kind of hard on, on, on poor CM Punk there, but like I said, it's like, you know, he's comes from an industry where overacting is the key, you know, yeah. and, you know, there's a lot of like intensity in the acting. Well, you know, I think it's all easy to act intense. 
it's a lot harder to act more even flow and be more realistic. And so once I think as he gets like, I hope he still continues to act because as you could see, like, like even with the rock, right. Yeah. I mean, Dwayne Johnson, I mean, when he started off, you know, he was pretty one note, but now he's actually got some good acting chops, you know, and he's, and I, you know, and I always like seeing him in roles, you know, cause I think he's got a lot of good range. Yeah. A lot, like um, I said, I, th- I think he fantastic and more of a horror comedy might be more his lane. Yeah, I think he would be like, great. Like it, you know what? And like, I think you nailed it. Really, if Bruce Campbell decides never to come back at Ash, and they're looking for a new Ash, I think they'd look at CM yeah. Punk. I think he'd be awesome at that role. Actually. Oh, here's another thing, uh, Brian, that you would be interested in. So, uh, Travis Stevens, who did the directing, his next movie is Jacob's Wife. It is also a horror film. Uh, the synopsis okay. here says Anne, married to a small town minister, feels her life has been shrinking over the past thirty years. Encountering the master brings her a new sense of power and an appetite to live bolder. However, the change comes with a heavy body count, and it stars none other than Miss Barbara Crampton. Oh, okay. I think I saw her. I think she was posting stuff about working on this film, actually. Yeah. So that's and uh, CM Punk's going to return nice. as Deputy Colton. Okay, so good. So, so let's let's see what kind of role that is now. That has the potential to be that kind of perfect horror com- comedic role. You know, because cops in horror movies, they they usually have a lot of, uh, there's there's like a, there's, there's either like that really good, like intense cop kind of in the role, or there's that little bit of comedic yeah. kind of role in it. Just, uh, you know, Sans, like, uh, it was funny. It was, I was, I'm still reading that Halloween book, which I, I just, I'm, I'm like so sad it's coming to an end <laughs> because I'm, I mean, even though at 400 plus pages, I, I could have gone on another 500 pages. It's that good. Uh, but I was reading and they were saying how good, um, you know, uh, uh, Brad Dourif was in um, as Sheriff Brackett, yeah. you know, in the Rob mm-hmm. Zombie Halloween. And and I was like, you're right. You know, he really played it good. And I'm like, that's that's rare for a horror cop to have that much emotion behind him like that, you know. And so that's kind of like, you know, that, you know, if they go that way. I don't know if CM Punk, that's the right take on him, but I think if he's like at that, like that, like little bit of comedic, yeah, the the funny cop, the cop edge you know? thing, yeah, I think that would be perfect. Yeah, I think he might. I think that he's got, he's got it, like a Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah, kind of guy. yeah, exactly, like one of those guys. Oh, uh, yeah. let's go through the trivia here. There's only three items uh, for this movie. Yeah, uh, it was filmed in a re- re- reputed haunted house in Frankfort, Illinois. Uh, near the start of the film, Don is showing opening a bottle of beer. Phil Brooks in Real life is a straight edge, meaning he refuses to drink alcohol or any other recreational drug. And uh, at one point, the film in the film, the main character's name, Don Cook, is mispronounced Coke instead of Cook. Phil Brooks, who plays Don, is known for having a large Pepsi logo tattoo, which you can see on him during the film. Yeah. And also the Pepsi plunge was one of his signature moves during his wrestling career. So it's kind of a funny uh, nod to his Pepsi love. Yeah. I now I'm not, I didn't know much about CM Punk. I don't even think I knew that his move, but I know a Cody. Cody's a big uh, wrestling fan. I haven't been into it really in a while, other than uh, you know knowing some of the big people. But so Cody, uh, if you know about uh, how that that whole Pepsi thing with him came place, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's on Netflix. So there's no reason not to just check it out if you're already a Netflix right. subscriber. You're not uh, any money. I think it's an interesting film to see just for the horror elements. Uh, you could probably safely skip the first half hour and not miss much, but uh, well, then you really won't yeah, know what's but, going uh, on. Though. I don't know. It's it's you, you, one of those you kind of have to make up your own mind. It, like I said, it, it's almost like two different movies. There's a lot of good, a lot of bad, and it just never quite gels to the point. I think there's a good movie in there somewhere, it just hasn't quite bubbled to the surface yet. But I'm looking forward to what Travis Stevens does next. I'm very interested in Jacob's Wife, his next feature. I think he does have a lot of promise. I think CM Punk has a lot of promise. So I'm not yeah. counting these these people out on the basis of this, of this movie at all. In fact, I think quite the opposite. I think it shows a lot of potential. Yeah, it was funny because I actually, for a second there, I thought you were going to go start singing uh, the facts of life. You're like, the good, the bad. Yeah. I was like, you, you take know, them both, and there you have the I, girl on the third floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, if only we knew that ready, we could have had a good skit. Oh, yeah. With, uh, yeah. In and I, I just remembered while randomly while we were talking about this, I forgot to talk about in the first chop a movie I watched uh, today, and I'm just going to save it for next week because it's too good. 
Um, but it was Tammy and the T-Rex. But I'll save that discussion for next week. Oh, yeah. yeah. By the way, I just forgot. We should have mentioned this, actually. What got this actually on my radar was actually, so Travis Stevens won Best First Feature in the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards this year. Oh, so, okay. So that should have basically clued us in right there. I should have just realized. I remember I'm like, is that his first feature? Yeah. Friend? Obviously, we're a little a little uh, distracted. We didn't prep as well as we, we should have on this. But yeah, well, yeah. But I, I would definitely give this movie a chance. I definitely would not. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, like Tim said, it's on Netflix. Most people, we all have Netflix. Just, I, you know, give it a check. You know, and I, I wouldn't even not I would would write off watching it again. Actually, at some point, to try and really see if I can. Uh, you know, that, sometimes it, it, after the first viewing, if you go in if either not expecting something or expecting something, you know, and you're not ready for what the movie's like, sometimes you you you, you tend to get distracted enough that you miss stuff. So I, I would even give it another shot one time. To, yeah. I mean, not right away, but I would I would definitely see it again to see check it out. Yeah. So. All right. So what do we have for our beer pairing this week? OK, this one, the beer is called The Third Floor. Nice. Uh, it's by Forest Domain Brewing Company in Ambler, PA. Uh, and it's 9.5% uh, uh, ABV. And here's actually – so I, I had trouble finding a description of this because the brewery's uh, website is under construction. But what makes this beer pairing so good, it's not even going to be the description so much. But the reason why it's called the third floor because the brewery is in an old house that has a mysterious like third floor attic. Mm. And that's where they named the beer from. So and obviously if you've watched this movie, that third floor is very mysterious, like this mysterious attic kind of balcony or bleachers what he refers it to <laughs> which comes into play in a plot point that i didn't expect either but so yeah so that's why that's another reason why this beer pairing actually uh, on the surface may not just seem like oh well because it's the third floor but actually it has a little backstory to the brewery itself which what makes this a good match but what i got is i got a review from uh one of the the untapped uh drinkers and so it says um uh, a different take on belgian style triple with a saison twist very effervescent, almost like a brute, but without the hops. Interesting. And then, it, yeah, and so like I said, the brewery is an old house with a third floor attic similar to the film. And actually, the house didn't look so different than the film's house. Hmm. So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. interesting. That was just a, that was yeah, a good one. A little serendipitous match. Yeah. yeah. All right. So our triple threat last week, we were looking for an actor or actress, and we threw a curveball at you. This is not a, an actor known for his horror roles. We were talking of Harry Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe. So yeah. he did do some horror films. Yeah, though. the Woman in Black, which is which is pretty good. Um, yeah, and I think that's the movie we're going to do, right? When we ta- uh, team up with uh, Fox and the Fox. Yeah, for yeah, an episode, exactly. Right? So clue number one: in my first role, I played a character who was not magical but shares the name of someone who is. Daniel's first role was the younger version of David in a TV version of the Charles Dickens classic David Copperfield, which of course shares the name of the well-known American illusionist. That was a really yeah. tricky. Uh, Clue, there, uh, clue but... number two, my most well-known role, is also the main character of a very popular book series. That should have been a big clue. Uh, Daniel, of yeah, course, played clue. Harry Potter in the film series based on the books of the same name. And clue number three, I became the youngest non-royal to have an individual portrait displayed in London's prestigious National Portrait Gallery. Radcliffe was only 14 years old when he posed for artist Stuart Pearson Wright during a break from filming Harry Potter. And that's actually funny enough. That's probably the clue you could have probably looked up. And found the answer right away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so this week we're looking for a fictional character. Listen closely. Clue number one. While I am a major character, my survival, while probable, is still a bit ambiguous. Clue number two. While I tragically lost my daughter at a young age, I had a second chance at fatherhood to an adopted daughter. And clue number three. The actor that played me is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe along with the DC Cinematic Universe. Yeah, so that's actually that's, that's a good clue. not that many people, yeah. actually. So that should be able to be narrowed down. So who am but. I? Another Again, a fictional character. So that was good. I like that one. Yeah, that's a fun one. All right, Brian, it's time for our Zabmondo. Yeah. This, this, our last Zabmondo, though, I think I was like, uh, that was, it got so like, it was like pretty deep. Yeah, it got very kind of hope we get like yeah. a, we got a fun one. I, th- I think this will be the one that we'll do because uh, I don't think um, we would. Uh, I don't think I would be able to uh, say this without blushing um, <laughs> w- with our guest last week. So I'll do it for this okay. week for us. Are you ready? I'm ready. It says, would you rather find out? 
find out that while drunk the night before, you flash the elderly woman who lives next door, or that you pounded the hell out of your own car with a hammer. <laughs> They're pretty two different things there. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. And, ooh, this is a tough one because I actually have an elderly neighbor next door. Oh my and God, you she has it. actually made comments while I was outside working out. <laughs> oh, so this one, this one hits the, a little, little too, too close, close to, to home. home I, here. There was one time I went outside because I was uh, getting ready for a formal event. And I had a suit on, and she was over there, and she goes, "Ooh, you're all dressed up." And then there was another oh, no. time when I was out there working out, and she's made some other kind of. Um, comment that made me think she was uh, getting an eyeful. So I think she would very much oh, no. enjoy me flashing her while drunk. Oh, I'm God. afraid. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, I don't want to beat the hell out of my car. Now, in my case, my car is a 2005 Corolla. It was paid for long ago. It's the clear coat's completely gone off of it. I could probably take a hammer to it and not mess up the looks that terribly. <laughs> so, yeah. That's not as this is actually a harder choice for me than you realize, Brian. Um, yeah, I think it is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna wait on it, I'm gonna let you answer it. I gotta think about this one a minute. Oh, god. Um, I you know, either one to me, I think I, I know this sounds crazy, but I think like, and now I am not by any means insulting the elderly <laughs> when I say this, but I think I would pick the first one for this one reason, hopefully. It would be one of the elderly people that needs glasses to see. <laughs> so I might be able to get away with it without it really being noticed at what I'm doing. <laughs> and also, it could be something that could be explained as, out of. But, like, you slam your car. You're, like, dealing with a lot of stuff afterwards. And how the heck are you going to, like, you know, you're going to have to pay and fix that. Most likely, if you just, like, kind of flash the elderly woman... You know, you could probably say, well, it wasn't for you or something like that, you know, or maybe they just couldn't tell. They couldn't see you're far enough away, you know, so I, I think I, w I would have to pick the first one just because I think I can. The aftermath <laughs> overall would probably be minimal. Well, I'm going to go with the just to be different. I think I'm going to go with the second one. OK, only because a I'm terrified that that lady would enjoy it too much. And yeah. and number two, I think my car is old enough that even if I beat it with a hammer, you're not going to notice it that it's got enough dents in it already. Oh. You may not notice. So, and plus, I feel like I'm doing it to my own self. Like, it, I would be scared. Like, if I flashed an elderly woman, like, what if she decided to press charges or something, or like call the cops, or I don't know. But at least with my car, I have. I mean, I could go outside right now and beat my car to death. Nobody can stop me. I've paid for it. It's completely bought yeah, and paid it, for. I can beat it to death if I want to. Well, it seems like with your elderly woman next door, you, that would be the least of your concerns about the cop. <laughs> I think you'd be more concerned she doesn't show up at your door with just a Civil Gore shirt on and no pants. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Say, you're that boy with the dulcet Ooh, tones. You know? I saw you working yeah, out you, the other day. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, and then, you know, then she'd like, you know, it'd be like that scene in like Yes Man with <laughs> Tilly, the next door neighbor, you know, and like Jim Carrey. Yeah, so t you'd be you'd be in some in in some, in a pickle. Yeah, I definitely. I, I might be able to just <laughs> do it and get away with it quick uh, enough. I don't know. That's so. a good one. I like that one. Kind of, that was kind of. But weird. Can you imagine having to do that last week with with poor Becca on there? Is oh, she probably like, would have loved it. We'd she, say yeah, something. She probably oh, she would have yeah, laughed, laughed and probably had a had a lot of fun at our expense, especially yours <laughs> apparently with this one. But uh, yeah, so but of course they have the little facts there. I'll read. It says. A man returned to his sports car to find a freshly dented fender in this note under the windshield wiper. The people who saw me hit your fender are now watching me write this note and probably figure I'm giving you my name and name and phone number. So you can contact me and send me the bill. You should live so long. <laughs> oh, that's that's nasty. But then and then here's something that's horrible. It says, according to the New York Times, dozens of rural Americans are killed every year after they drink too much, lie down in the middle of the highway and get run over. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, notice there's nothing about flashing the elderly neighbor in the yeah. factoids because it probably doesn't happen that often. Yeah, what is it with uh, <laughs> nudity and elderly people lately? We had the elder boobs from last episode. Uh, it's a disturbing oh, right. trend. I forgot about that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. 
But I, I want to know what the what those the Zamando has a lot of uh, naked. That that was the funniest thing when I was prepping for the last week's episode. What I did is just a little behind the scenes, real quick. So for Becca, you know, we wanted to obviously we wanted to add the game element into this game a little more. So we actually had her grab her dice before the game uh, before the show, and I literally just went through all the Zamandos actually uh, and going through and just putting the page number down from the book down in three columns so she could pick. But I was, uh, you know, obviously I was excluding anyone that we did on the show, thanks to Cody, with her great checklist. I had a reference point. Uh, but I was also taking out anything that might be uh, horrendously embarrassing for Tim and I. <laughs> uh, and I, so I remember during it, I'm like, texted Tim, I said, you know, there's a lot of naked questions in Zamando <laughs> here. <laughs> so I'm like, what the heck with this? With the, I mean, there must be, I'm, we must have done about a few already. I mean, it was already bad enough when Crystal had our, uh, came on as a uh, for our collaboration episode. We had the naked one or in a banana suit. That uh, yeah. was just that was bad oh on its gosh. own. So, all right, guys. Yeah. Well, we'll get out of here. Um, no snappy send off for me tonight. I just want everybody to stay safe, follow yes. precautions, be kind to other people, be very patient with other people, and we will get through this together. Yes, and don't. I know the the tendency is to. Uh, you know, to to hoard. Uh, the grocery stores are remaining open, and I did read an article. The food chains are in place. Yes, it may take a little bit longer to get in there. And remember also, another thing, just based on the thing, I know it sounds like we're preaching at you, but just, it, you know, it, it's important. Remember that the, the, the people that are working, like at the grocery stores, and are really, like, putting themselves at risk to make sure that you have the supplies. Like, don't complain that they're out of something or complain that their hours got shortened because they're using that time to sterilize the store and restock the shelves so things aren't in disarray for you when you come in the next day. So, and, you know, people like the postal office and the restaurant. Oh, and, we, and, and again, we should say, obviously, a lot of small businesses are going to be irreparably damaged from this and you're going to lose some of your favorites. And we, we talked with some of our friends uh, in our coaster community about this, you know, try and, and, you know, some of them are remaining open for takeout orders only, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you have a lot of, most of you stocked up on food, but you know what stuff that's frozen, it'll be still frozen after this. So maybe one night, you know, go, uh, you know, pay, uh, you know, go, go try out one of your, your local restaurants for one of their pickup things just to make sure they have a little bit left. And I will make one more suggestion too. I know we're rambling. I'm sorry. People are like, what the hell podcast is this anymore? <laughs> but, but you know, this is, this is difficult times. Uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, Kelly, I posted a great thing on Facebook. What he said is he said, even if you're, you know, you're not, the, you don't want to go visit per se uh, the restaurants right now or bring in, or you have so much food, you, you know, you're going to have to eat what you have. He put a great idea. He said, how about go to your favorite restaurants and buy a gift certificate and you can either give them out or keep it for yourself for a later date, but you're get, but buy it directly from the restaurant because then you're giving them the money now. And not taking the resources necessarily now with hopes that that may just keep them just out there a little bit longer. I mean, I had one, my favorite restaurant closed down for good and it was a big restaurant and it did tons of business. But based off, it was a all you can eat sushi buffet, Monado, that Tim and oh, Olivia yeah. got to try when they came in. And it's closed suddenly one day without any warning based off because they just lost. I guess they could not maintain that profit margin was probably slim to begin with but based on the the quality of sushi they had out there and you know they probably had to dispose of a lot of film and then a buffet is just so vulnerable during this time as at this as just as just the whole thing just started a buffet is kind of not an idea you want to put in your head with 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 this whole thing now so we lo I lo we lost that place and you know so I can't even imagine like smaller businesses which rely on every single order to just maintain their business and restaurant businesses are just not super profitable to begin with. It takes, what does it say? They say like three years yeah, to make back. That is, so, you? so you're on the cutting, I mean, on the razor's edge yeah. all the time. So, yeah. So, I mean, just, just think of that when you go, when this thing starts, even if, you know, if your restaurant, your places survive, as soon as you get a chance, go out and, and, and give them some business, you know, even if it costs you a little more, maybe than it would have off of an Amazon or something. Yeah, we're planning on uh, you know, eating let's... out at least a couple times this week. Even though we're definitely increasing our cooking and eating at home, we're planning on doing like a couple of takeout nights just to you know help support the yeah. businesses. Yeah, same with us because you know it's it's 
you know, these, these, you know, it's like if you're lucky enough to have a business that you can just work from home and, you know, it may be like tight business wise, but, you know, it'll recover and you really won't see it. Um, some businesses out there obviously are going to be destroyed by this. And we got to try and keep as many of the local small ones as we can, especially your favorites, because, you know, yeah, you, you just don't want to see that happen because of this. So. That's it. No, no more soapboxes. I feel like we've been on like a soapbox almost the whole episode here, yeah. but uh, it was it was more of a, a a friendly kind of like let's let's bring all together kind of a thing. And, and yes, and and to echo Tim, say stay safe out there, everybody. Try and and you know uh, just take care of yourselves and your family. And and Civil Gore will be with you the entire time. Yeah, and, and you, you use know. this time to catch up on your horror movie backlog, which I know you have. Yes, your Netflix backlog, which I know you have. Your horror novel backlog, which I know you have. That's what I'm planning on doing. So you know, make the best of it. Oh my god, Tim will be seven seven backlog <laughs> projects. He'll be oh, done yeah. with. That's <laughs> gonna be, uh, yeah, that's be awesome. So yeah, guys, stay safe, and we'll see you back here next week. See ya.